The 70 Series Toyota Land Cruiser has reached legendary status in Australia. It is arguably one of the pillars on which Toyota Australia's fortune has been built. It was unveiled in 1984 to replace the 40 Series Toyota Land Cruiser that came before, and it's still on sale now, making it 38 years old on sale and one of the oldest vehicles you can buy brand new globally. Now, apart from the wheelbase of the 79 series being significantly longer, 400 millimeters longer, in fact, the 79 series also has more fundamental changes inside that came around in 2016 to get this car a five-star and cap safety rating here in Australia. It's got five airbags, two curtain airbags, and a driver's knee airbag that the 76 series and the 78 series and even the 79 series dual cabs do not have here in Australia. So this should be the safest 70 series you can get your hands on. Now, we're gonna be testing this car, evaluating it critically, and talking about its flaws, and of course, the good aspects of this vehicle. One of the great things about this car being on sale for 38 years, in that time, the aftermarket has exploded for these vehicles. So you can pretty much solve any issue that I'm gonna be pointing out with a couple of aftermarket accessories. And I will be running over those as we go through this thing, because that's one of the greatest parts about the 70 series Toyota Land Cruiser, its customizability, and of course, its toughness. So let me know your thoughts on the 70 series Cruiser in the comment section down below before we get into this review. And if you haven't done so already and like content like this, then please consider subscribing below this video. So you may have caught Poncha's review of the LC76 series where he pointed out all the differences between the 70th anniversary and the regular GXL. They pretty much all apply here, but I'll go through them again. This grille at the front, I think is probably the highlight, especially in this lovely vanilla, French vanilla colorway. It has a real look of 300 series GR Sport about it that adds a little bit of extra toughness. This black bumper as well, adds a little bit of pizzazz, sort of modernizes the 70 series cruiser a little bit in my opinion. That carries through to the wheel arches as well. And of course, we've got the lovely Toyota Land Cruiser script. And I'm gonna have a bit of a font nerd out in this video when we get inside as well, because the owner's manual of this car is just so nicely designed and has a real charm about it. There is that sort of old school charm that Toyota has definitely leaned into. And I think that is what endears this car to a lot of people alongside, obviously, its reliability and proven toughness in Australia. Now, I will mention one other thing, a more general 70 series comment, and that is in 2007, when this car was widened to fit the four and a half liter V8 under the bonnet that is featured in this car and is the only engine you can actually get in Australia for the 70 series now, brand new, no more four cylinders or six cylinder deals. They actually widen the front track significantly, which is why we've got these over fenders here. Looks tough at the front, but once you've seen this, you'll never be able to unsee it. And that is the rear track was left the same. So you can see the wide track front and the narrow track rear. When you see one driving down the road next time, make sure you have a look at that because it does look a little bit funny. But overall, I think it's antiquated charm, it's toughness, it's so endearing. It looks so cool out on the road. Maybe the troop carrier looks cooler in your opinion. Let me know your thoughts down below. The Land Cruiser's cabin is nothing special. There's nothing really to write home about here, but it does the job it's meant to do. It's fit for purpose as a commercial vehicle that's just gonna work and feels actually pretty well built for something like this. There's lots of plastic, obviously, and it's not very well presented. It's not a beautiful, gorgeous, and exciting cabin, but you've got things like a 6.2 inch touchscreen, Bluetooth audio, navigation as well, and it is a double DIN size, so you could swap this out for a more modern non-Toyota Android Auto slash Apple CarPlay compatible head unit, which might be something that's worth doing down the track. Ahead of me, I've got some really simple and very legible analog dials. I've got a tachometer, I've got a speedometer that goes up to 200 Ks an hour, and I've got oil voltage and water temperature gauges. So that's all really good to have. And it allows you to monitor this car on longer trips where it might be getting hot and just keep an eye on everything that's going on. Now we do have a bit of chintz going on here in this 70th anniversary. This fake wood on top of the steering wheel also appears here in front of the passenger with a little gold 70th anniversary emblem. I, I don't know, maybe it's a little trying too hard, but you don't have to go for the 70th anniversary and going for the GXL or lower grades, you don't get all this perhaps excessive chintz in my book. Now, practicalities are an interesting one as well because this little armrest doesn't really sit in the right spot for my arm, but I can rest my arm up on top of the hard finished door where you get to see the French vanilla once again inside. Very nice indeed. Got a little grab handle here and recently the Land Cruiser has actually ended up with having a center console down here So you 
we've got a little storage pocket down here, two 2.1 amp USB chargers, uh, cup holders here that are big enough for about a 700 mil bottle. I think it was a missed opportunity to not make them just a little bit more generous so you could fit a 1.5 liter bottle in there. But hey, actually, if you want to address that, you can buy an aftermarket center console for this car. It's about a thousand bucks and it has an armrest as well, which this car doesn't have. So you can really tailor this vehicle to whatever you want to do. Up here, we've got two more USB ports, an ashtray, cigarette lighter, and the button for putting the antenna up and down right here, just below a really simple to use HVAC system where you just have basic levers that move things around. And, you know, it's not as impressive as a modern climate control system, but it works. AC here blows super cold, nice and cold, as you'd expect from a Toyota. And the solidity of the way that the door slams suggests that this car is really well sealed, as you want if you're going to be going into the outback with this vehicle. It's going to keep the bull dust out pretty nicely. Now, finally, let's chat about the seats because they are pretty rudimentary. They're upholstered in a sort of premium vinyl in this vehicle, which isn't leather, um, but it's not cloth that you get in the GXL either, but it's not as cheap feeling as the base Workmate and the GX vinyl seats. They're manually adjustable, but they don't offer much support or adjustment. But again, as Ponch mentioned in the LC76 review, it is super easy to jump on ARB, find yourself a set of Recaro seats and just replace them. So yeah, if you're gonna own this car for a while, that's what you're gonna end up doing. Now back finally to the physical controls, back to the steering wheel, which actually feels quite nice in the hand, certainly looks better than the early airbag wheels in this car. They're not as gorgeous as the sort of early 90s and late 80s vehicles with their nice spindly steering wheel. Very nice, uh, solid feeling manual gear shifter here. Long in the throw, of course, but there is a sort of satisfying thunky clunkiness to it that suits the rest of this vehicle. You've got your high and low gear selector down here as well, and your diff lock, which is just hidden there behind the steering wheel. Now, there are also a lot of switch blanks in this car, which is a bit weird given it is the top spec, but then again, as is the theme of this video, it seems that down the track you can add extra things, so UHF radios and all that sort of thing can plumb them in and have it looking fairly factory, fairly OEM, and keep the whole thing nice and tidy. Now, I'm not going to show you the back seat because there isn't one. This is just the single cab variant, of course, so only two doors, but we do have a little bit of extra storage behind these seats, a little bit of cabin storage for backpacks, for jumpers, for your umbrella or anything like that. You've got a glove box down there as well. So yeah, that's the Toyota Land Cruiser. Finally, before we finish up, nice little fonts here, lovely little plaque down here to know you've got the 70th anniversary edition, and I'll lean in here and show you the lovely owner's manual. I actually think this is a really nice little piece of design, and it's not something that um, lots of manufacturers pay attention to, but yeah, having the Land Cruiser script really quite nicely written, thoughtful forward, yeah, nice little detail. Definitely feels like something that Toyota has put time into. So yeah, not perfect, but it's yours for the making. You can make whatever you want of this cabin, if you spend a little bit of time and money researching it. At the back of the 79 series, we've currently just got the standard tray on the back here. It measures about 2.55 meters long and 1.78 meters wide, which is fairly generous and is longer than you're gonna get in the dual cab. The payload of this vehicle is 1,225 kilograms as well. Now we've got those measurements out of the way, what really matters is the customizability of a vehicle like this, because although in my book, initially I thought that the LC76 would make more sense as a touring and camping vehicle, but actually the truth is that there is, seems to be a lot of options out there for the 79 series, either in single cab or dual cab guys, that give you a plethora of options to set this car up for camping. Canopies, fold-out kitchens, rooftop tents. If you want it, someone's probably done it before for the 79 series ute. And that means it's gonna be super easy to set this car up to do a lap of Australia, which really feels like that's what this vehicle is made to do in private buyer's hands. Of course, for mining companies and that sort of thing, they're gonna do something different. Maybe they'll leave it standard, maybe they'll GVM upgrade and carry some tools in the back. But the beauty of the ute is the fact that it is a blank canvas. That's why it potentially makes more sense than going for a 76 series wagon, which arguably boxes you in a little bit more. It's the same story with the troop carrier, but at least Toyota still offers them all and gives such a broad choice for anyone who wants an old school, gorgeous and exciting Toyota Land Cruiser. One more thing I'll point out though, that really harks back to this car being old, the number plate placement. It looks really sketchily made little bit of an afterthought, but hey, it works. And that's kind of one of the joys of this car is there's a lot of details like that where you go, oh, that could have been nicely made, but what's there works. And that's what this car is all about at the end of the day. Even though the Land Cruiser's four and a half liter turbo diesel V8 is severely understressed and it had more advanced piezoelectric 
injectors added in 2016, along with a diesel particulate filter to become a Euro 5 emission standard engine, this is not a fuel efficient vehicle. The ADR combined figure is 10.7 litres per 100 k's, but in our testing of about 450 k's so far, this thing has already drunk through half of its 130 litre fuel tank, giving it a real world fuel economy of 14 to 14.5 litres per 100 k's. And it's actually especially bad on the freeway when you're trying to keep up with traffic, where this car's, I assume, terrible aerodynamic efficiency kind of hurts it but that's not what this car is about it's not a lightweight aerodynamically efficient vehicle it is a Toyota Land Cruiser servicing is due every six months or 10,000 kilometers and is capped for 10 services over five years and 100,000 k's you're going to be paying $3,750 to maintain this vehicle at your Toyota dealership and over the last 12 months the median budget direct customer paid $1,263 to comprehensively insure their new Toyota Land Cruiser now your premium may vary based on things that insurers take into account, such as where you live, your age, your driving history, and whether or not you garage the vehicle. The 70 series Toyota Land Cruiser drives in much the same way that it looks. You don't get any surprises when you get behind the wheel of this thing. It feels pretty old school, but there's a lot of charm about that old school nature, though it's certainly not suited for absolutely every buyer out there who's looking for a ute. But hey, you already know that when you're looking at this video. Now under the bonnet of this thing is a four and a half litre turbo diesel V8 that's been in this vehicle since about 2007 when it was re-engineered for it. It's been tweaked over the time with more emission stuff for Australia, but it essentially remains unchanged. The outputs currently sit at 151 kilowatts of power and 430 newton meters of torque. Now that's one kilowatt less than a Hilux and a bunch less torque as well. And I think that really goes to show just how understressed this engine is. It's not fast, but there is so much meaty low end torque. That 430 Newton meter figure is spread from 1200 RPM. So basically not far above idle all the way to 3200 RPM. And thanks to this car's short gearing, it feels pretty peppy up to about 70 or 80 Ks now, but much above that, it does feel a little slow. And I think it's happiest cruising between sort of 50 to 90 Ks an hour on country roads like this, or cruising down forestry roads where the suspension is actually reasonably comfortable, I think because of the longer wheelbase of this 79 series. But I'll come back to that in just a minute because let's talk about the transmissions. There's only one transmission you can get with this car now in Australia, a five-speed manual gearbox. Yes, the throws are long and they're quite meaty. You need to be very firm and almost a little bit persuasive with this gearbox to get it going right. And it needs a little bit of time for the box oil to warm up as well. In the mornings when you start driving it away from your house, and personally, I live in the inner west, so it's, uh, it's not the ideal place for a 79 series cruiser, something that's this long. Um, it takes a little while for the gearbox to warm up, but now we've been driving for ages and it is feeling pretty slick. Heavy, definitely heavy, and it will hurt those who have uh, slightly more dainty wrists, but hey, it makes it feel very tough, very stout. It's a feeling this whole car has pretty much the whole time you're driving it. And I know I said car, and it's not a car, it's a four-wheel drive. Now, it's also hooked up to a several-speed transmission box, so you've got high two-speed, high four-wheel drive, and you've got a low-speed transfer case as well. That's for this car's off-roading credentials. Now, we haven't had time to properly test all of its rock crawling ability here at Chasing Cars. We might be able to do that in the future, but Sydney's wet weather means that a lot of the trails are closed. Where we have tested it is on forestry roads where its suspension actually feels quite settled, much better than most single cabs out there on the market. Single cab chassis utes can often feel very skittish when they're unladen, but I think the extra wheelbase of this car versus the LC76 wagon actually really settles it on the road. So even though there's not that much weight over the back wheels, you can actually make pretty decent progress. The handling is very faithful, very consistent, and easy to judge. It's not a fast car on a country road, but when driven with a little bit of care and caution for the size and the slow steering ratio of this thing, it actually can be quite enjoyable and quite rewarding for the driver. Just pay attention to what this car demands of you to make the best out of it. Speaking of how the LC79 steers, this thing has an almighty turning circle as well. Again, not ideal for living in the inner west, but that's, again, not where one of these is gonna spend most of its life. So 14.4 meters it takes for this car to turn around, do a 180 degree turn. And to do that, you have to spin the wheel 4.4 turns lock to lock. This worm and roller steering box setup is slow, but I do understand why Toyota's done it. 
it's very reliable and also on the freeway you can make small adjustments to this car and not upset the balance of this thing which will really help as well if you've got a bit of a lift kit on it just makes it nice and calm and it means that it doesn't get wrestled out of your hands when you're driving down a dirt road either now the suspension's not perfect and the dampers feel like they could be a little bit higher quality have a little bit more give and a bit more control of the car but there are so many aftermarket options that you can fit to this thing old man emu and all those other brands that are offering lift kits upgraded suspension with adjustable compression and rebound damping down the track so if you don't like how this 79 comes out of the factory you can adjust it to your preferences finally let's talk a little bit about the nvh of this thing which is not great when you're driving along at highway speeds this car is sitting in fifth gear the super short gearing means that it's sitting about 2400 rpm which can be a little little tiring on long highway slogs you can just hear the noise of that v8 and the snorkel sucking in all that air while you're cruising down the freeway there's a lot of wind noise as well owing to the fact that this thing is a brick and as i said at the start it just feels most comfortable cruising along at decent country speeds of about 80 k's an hour 80 or 90 k's an hour is where it seems to be the most happy and that's as well backed up by the fact that this engine doesn't have a great top end it doesn't breathe that well um, and finally coming on to safety because this is somewhere that the 70 series Land Cruiser is obviously a long way behind a lot of modern vehicles so you've got nothing like lane keep assist or adaptive cruise control of course there's no AEB, rear cross traffic alert or blind spot monitoring I mean look at the mirrors they're just mirrors but the vision in this car is so good that you almost don't need a lot of those aids you don't even have parking sensors or a reversing camera yet it's still rated as five stars this 79 series single cab Butte because it does have the curtain airbags the front driver airbag including a knee airbag and one for the passenger which should aid its safety in a crash so that's a bit of a review of the Land Cruiser 70 series single cab out on the road I actually think it's quite well polished this suspension setup for what this car is and for its commercial and you know intentions of being rough and tumble and tough and you expect almost worse and I think I was pleasantly surprised when I got some speed on this thing out on the open road and found that the longer wheelbase just left it a little bit more settled than that 76 series wagon that I had a little spin of and Ponch had a detailed review of a couple of weeks ago so yeah the 79 series is absolutely fit for purpose not many bells and whistles but for what you need for reliability and dependability obviously it's still a Toyota Land Cruiser so that is a detailed review of the Toyota Land Cruiser 79 series single cab. What do we think of this car? Well, it's not perfect. This vehicle is far from perfect, in fact, but arguably most of the vehicles on sale right now, if not all of the vehicles, are also imperfect. They all require a little bit of modification to make them perfect where I want. And that is the great thing about the 70 series. There is so much knowledge. There are so many options for modification, so many things you can change to make it your own, to craft your own vehicle exactly how you want for what you want to do. And I think that is the enduring charm of this fairly old school Toyota Land Cruiser. Now, I was only really able to give this car a five and a half out of 10 in my written reviews. The same story with Ponch and the LC76. Now that score is low, but it reflects the fact that here at Chasing Cars, we have to evaluate these cars as a brand new vehicle that you can go out and buy today and the fact is at $80,000 before on-road costs as the list price let alone the price that a dealer might be charging the LC76 or the 79 series don't make much sense as a value buy with their lack of safety features and fairly antiquated driving experience but as I said at the top of this segment it is a car that you can make your own and there are very few vehicles out there that allow you this level of customization and allow you this level of reliability and toughness so that is why the Land Cruiser 70 series is still a popular vehicle in Australia and it still has its charms for a driver but of course I'd love to hear what you think of the Land Cruiser 70 series in the comments section down below and if you haven't done so already we'd also love it if you could hit subscribe to Chasing Cars and as always thank you so much for watching